but I'm a, a junior group leader um, in a, well, two basic interests uh, that are highlighted in this title. The first one is um, iPS cells and skeletal muscle organoids, <laughs> and the second one is gene therapy, and this is how I started my career, and it's kind of following me through even now. Uh, because I established my group in the uh, TARGET laboratory. So TARGET stands for Translational Research in Gene Therapies. And since I have a little bit of time, I, I just wanted to spend maybe one minute to explain you what we're doing in the lab. Um, so we're a group of maybe 50 people uh, head by, headed by uh, Dr. Omeya Ajali. And the lab has five different teams that are all more or less focused on gene therapies. Uh, for now, we've specialized in skeletal muscle disease, but also retinal disorders. Uh, two groups are focused in uh, dividing strategies for um, to, to, to develop uh, gene therapy strategies to cure these diseases. We also have more translational groups, one of them interested in the immune response after gene transfer. Another one focused in improving vectors, ALV vectors. Um, to perform more efficient uh, gene therapy. And the last one is my group uh, that is aimed to um, develop new models to test gene therapy strategies before or in as an alternative to uh, animal experimentation. So um, <clears throat> today I'm, uh, I wanted to tell you a story uh, that started 10 years ago when I was a PhD student in Nantes. Uh, so in the very same lab I'm in today. Uh, at the time, we were trying to evaluate the efficiency of an LED vector uh, after injection in a dystrophic muscle. So we had two groups of mice, uh, healthy mice and GMT mice, and we injected an LED8 GFP vector in the muscle and looked at what happened uh, two months after injection. And as you can see here, with the same initial dose, the GFP signal is much lower in the GMD muscle than to the Y side. Um, so to explain this, we had obviously a, a lot of hypotheses, uh, and, and we we'll tried to, to go step by step and to list a number of, of what we call restriction factors that could uh, reduce AAD efficiency. Uh, so we proved that two of them at least were active in the GMD mouse. The first one was muscle degeneration that leads to vector genome turnover over time. And the other one is oxidative stress that affects uh, transgene mRNA and leads to its more uh, faster turnover as well. But actually a lot of other uh, factors might add to this, for example, fibrosis, inflammation, uh, the, the, the fact that the muscle architecture is disrupted, so maybe the vector trafficking is altered as well. Uh, epigenetic silencing, and some others that you might think about. Uh, well, actually, one of them was also uh, came up from a paper that you guys published uh, in 2012 uh, related to the um, the change in vector efficiency as tadomyocytes become more mature after birth, which is correlated with the upregulation of the mRN genes. And we actually checked the expression of the mRN complex in GMD muscle and proved that it was upregulated. So a combination of things that led us to think that the vector was really not suited to perform in a GMD muscle. Uh, so to solve this problem, we elaborated strategies for second generation gene therapy, uh, which consisted in basically trying to use uh, a drug any drug that would help the vector being more effective. But which one? Uh, we asked the questions. Uh, compared to what we have seen here, we might choose anything that might improve the muscle state, for example, an antifibrous drug, anti inflammatory, epigenetic, uh, antioxidants, or anything that might make the muscle better, and finally, the, the vector more efficient in this context. Um, so after basically literally spending a few hours on PubMed, I ended up, this was in 2014, uh, we ended up with a list of several dozens of different compounds 
that were shown to improve the MDX, MDX mice, so the GMD, Duchenne phenotype, uh, so that could poss possibly be applied in our situation. Uh, and this is only some of them here in this in this uh, table, prednisolone, betlazapult, acetylbenzone, and so forth. All of them could be applied to our strategy and could help us potentially improve vector efficiency. Now try to imagine doing this in mice. This would have required hundreds, maybe thousands of MZX mice in parallel, including the controls you need to show, well, to screen actually, and to be able to identify precisely which one of these drugs might be the most effective. Which obviously for financial and ethical reasons was not really an option at the time. Um, so we ended up with several solutions. Like I said, start a new project with hundreds of mice, handpick your favorite candidate drugs and test it in just the dozens, or maybe abandon the project altogether, which was also another option. So we decided to go for this one, handpick the favorite candidates. And since we observed that oxidative, oxidative stress was uh, really an issue for a vector, we decided to choose an acetylcysteine, which is a very easy drug, drug to use. You just need to dilute it in the, in the water, in the mild transit, and their oxidative stress is supposed to be improved. In our case, it didn't work. So we spent a month trying just one drug in already maybe 50 mice with the controls and didn't work. So we switched from this solution to this one, abandoned the project, and I left the lab. <laughs> so then I think I thought maybe there was a smarter solution to this problem. That would have been to develop a new model that was more suited to high throughput screening and be able, in order to be able to test maybe not all of them, but a large number of drugs in parallel. So then five years, two postdocs, and obviously one pandemic later, I went back to the very same lab uh, to try to do this, actually, to divide a new model, based this one on protocol stem cell, no longer on animal experimentation, to be able to have this and, and try many different uh, gene therapy vectors or strategies in parallel. So for this, uh, I'm using pluripotent stem cells. Um, you probably all know this, but I'm, I'm still going to say a few words about that. Um, we start from a patient, human patient, and from this patient, we take some cells, for example, PBMCs or urine, you know, urine stem cells. Uh, those cells already have the mutations, and we turn them back into pluripotent stem cells, so pluripotency, by you know the Yamanata factors and all that, and it gives you it gives you uh, cell banks that you can then store and then further differentiate into your cell type of interest. It can be kidney, it can be liver, it can be skin, it can be heart, it can also be skeletal muscle. Uh, you can do this in a in a monolayer of cells in a petri dish in two dimensions, but you can also try to imagine and to develop more complex models, sometimes with several cell types in it, to try and recapitulate what happens in vivo uh, as closely as possible. And this is what we call organoids or engineered tissues in the context of heart and muscle. Obviously, the advantage is that uh, it comes directly from the patient, so you're in the very same genetic background as the patient. It's uh, expandable, so you can make very large banks of cells, which is compatible with high throughput analysis. And it can also uh, somehow recapitulate what happens during embryonic development in a dish, uh, which of course is very hard, sometimes impossible to do in vivo. Uh, and it allows you to uh, study the early impact of the mutation as development goes by. 
so in our case, we're interested in skeletal muscles, so in basically myogenesis and trying to study the, the different steps of myogenesis in a healthy context, but also in a patient's context. And through my uh, first postdoc uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, I established uh, well, a strong collaboration with the, the two PIs that uh, I was working with at the time, uh, Casey Childers and David Mack. And they have been able to send me uh, their cell lines. So now in the lab, we have three different cell lines. One comes directly from a DMD patient, so patients with Duchenne, muscular dystrophy. We have a healthy donor line in parallel. And from this one, we have been able to generate an isogenic line that bears the DMD mutation uh, generated through crispr cas 9 in the very same genetic background. So those two have the same, the exact same genome, and the only difference is the DMD mutation, which allows us to study exactly the impact of the mutation itself. Um, we are able to differentiate those lines into skeletal muscle, going through the different steps of myogenesis in a dish. Uh, it starts by uh, inducing the formation of paraxial medial derm, which happens in two to four days. Um, then go through the somite stage, uh, which is uh, achieved by day 10 of differentiation. And then from the somites, you go slowly through um, skeletal muscle, primary myogenesis, and you end up after one month uh, with very dense cultures of cells that have all what well, everything you need to do uh, myogenesis in a dish. So from this, you can isolate a population of myogenic progenitors simply by a mechanical dissociation. You can also enrich with some uh, facts studies um, in myogenic progenitors. And then after receding, you can differentiate those progenitors into myotube and you have something that looks much more what you could observe with primary cell lines or um, you know, uh, immortalized cell lines from patients. Um, so altogether, this takes uh, no more than, I would say, 40 to 45 days. Uh, but the advantage is that we can um, stop here and expand myogenic progenitors from the IPS cells and simply work with this cell population that can be expanded and stored and uh, basically differentiated into myotubes in not even two weeks. So it's pretty convenient. Uh, so we don't have to go back to the IPS stage every time we want to, to have myotubes. Um, very briefly, a word of my second postdoc at ISTEM. I participated in a study uh, with uh, Christian Pans in the team of Christian Pansé with these two postdocs, uh, in which we published the transcriptome. We did a very large um, study uh, on more than, I mean, it was nine replicates. And in IPS cells, those replicates were all differentiated for 25 days collected at different time points and analyzed by um, RNA sequencing in bulk, so no single cell here. But uh, to make a long story short, we showed that the cells express the right markers at the right time. So at day three, they express markers of the paraxial mesoderm, for example, the PNP, uh, brachyury and TBX genes. Later on, at day 10, the express marker of the somite stage, for example, NEOX1, NR2F1, PTN, etc. Mm -hmm. And from day 20, uh, sorry, 17 and 25, they start expressing markers of skeletal muscle, actins, myosins, uh, myoD, myoG, everything you can expect. So they bear the identity of the tissue we're trying to mimic in vitro. They are in the right lineage at the right time, and they're not really contaminated by other lineages, um, for example, neural cells. Uh, we don't have anything like neural cells. We don't have heart cells, or very few, undetectable. We don't have uh, a lot of fibroblasts as well. So we are achieving, um, I would say, 75 to 90% pure muscle purchase from IPSS. So, um, 
And now, what I wanted to, to talk about from those cells today can be divided in three different aims. The first one aims to identify very early disease genotypes and potentially new therapeutic targets. And then we'll switch to um, the topic of interest potentially uh, through the generation of patient-derived organoids that can be expanded and used as a model uh, for protein drug testing. And I will very briefly show you our first efforts to optimize AV transduction in this model to do in vitro gene therapy. <clears throat> so, N1. Like I said, um, we're able to recapitulate what happens during development in a dish. And through, this was also during my first postdoc, uh, through a collaboration with Cole Platnell, one of the big guys in RNA-seq and single-cell RNA-seq at the University of Washington. Uh, we applied a new method of uh, single-cell RNA-seq using combinatorial indexing, which allowed us to, um, to, to study and sequence more than 20 different samples in just one experiment. And to analyze 10 different time points of this myogenic differentiation in a dish. And what you can see here is that the cells separate in different clusters that correspond to the different um, uh, myogenic intermediates. We start from pluripotent cells and they quickly go to a um, primitive streak and then paraxial mesoderm and then the somite and then skeletal muscle. So we would have this what we have seen in bug RNA seq data, but not with a much higher resolution at the single cell level. Okay, so everything's fine now. Um, we also have expression of lineage specific markers at the different times, which allows us to stage these cells, obviously. Uh, but now if you uh, try to, if you have a, a healthy control and a line from a DNA patient side by side in the same differentiation, what you can see is that uh, in some of the clusters, uh, those two populations of cells are somehow intermingled altogether. But later on, you have clusters that are more specific to the GMZ line and clusters that are more specific to the wild side, to the health control. So we tried to reconstruct what we call developmental trajectory from this single cell data. Uh, which is a very automatic process done by computer biology and its automated analysis. And what the computer told us is that the cells at the beginning, they are in the very same branch here at the IPS stage. And as differentiation progresses in pseudo time, they reach a point here from where most of the DMD cells go to one branch and most of the Y type go to another. Which means that after a while, those cells adopt a different phase in differentiation and they don't end up in the same stage, myogenic more or less uh, stage. Uh, and that this happens from day seven to day 10. This is a, a time, you know, a deep evolution of this very same trajectory. And as you can see, the cells reach the branching point at day seven, and at day 10, most of them are already separating in the two branches. The day seven and 10 correspond to the somite stage. So our efforts right now is to try to understand what happens specifically at this stage that makes the DMD cells go sideways and maybe be uh, less sensitive to the stimuli um, that, are, that they are exposed to in vitro. Just a few words, uh, we have also analyzed um, in parallel a CRISPR, CRISPR line, remember, that I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. And this is a bulk rna data at the end stage of differentiation, so at the myotube stage, in which you can see that we still find this difference between healthy and GMG cells, but the CRISPR line behaves somehow differently as the, as the GMD and as the one side. So, it looks like both the mutation, but also the genetic background have an influence 
I mean, everybody kind of knows this, but it, it's one way to, to look at it and to, to demonstrate it. So really now what we're trying to do is to um, look specifically at the genes themselves and see, well, those are myogenic regulators. And as you can see, the DMZ lines have uh, a very, um, seems to under, well, the, all the regulators are downregulated in DMZ myotubes, I mean, most of them. And the crystal line shows an intermediary profile between the wild type and the DMD. So it's like the DMD goes sideways, the crystal also goes sideways, but maybe in a slightly different direction and slightly later in time. So now we're analyzing day 10 and day 17 at the single cell resolution to see what happens for the DMD cells and for the CRISPR and try to solve this together. Right, so like I was saying, one of the pending questions we're trying to answer is when does the dissipation first manifest itself in the CRISPR and the DMD cells? And so that's we're focusing on day 10 and day 17. Okay, so no switching directly no, without transition to N2. Uh, in parallel, we're also making our best to try and generate an in vitro platform to have um, an alternative way to test our therapies um, and to make them more compatible with high super screening. The challenge, as you might know, is that, um, and I, I assume this is the same for plasmiocytes, uh, when you differentiate um, iPS cells into myotubes, they have a very low level of maturation. They remain embryonic or fetal. Um, and this is visible in, uh, through various uh, parameters. For example, they express um, isoforms of embryonic and fetal uh, muscle proteins, for example, myosins, actins, or acetylcholine receptors. Uh, when you look at them, they show signs of immaturity. For example, they're very, uh, well, some of them are very thin and spindly. Others are very large, but they show like big clusters of nuclei that are not uh, not very well um, located in the cells. Uh, those structures are also heterogeneous, meaning that you have muscle, but you also have some or something else, and we don't really know what those are. And finally, uh, some of them spontaneously contract some of the time, but in a very uncontrolled manner. I mean, it's very heterogeneous. It's very, um, it's not something you would expect with a normal muscle uh, if you don't have motor neurons to induce contraction, but we still see it in a dish, which means that the cells, they have all the machinery, they have all what's needed to do contraction, but they don't have the proper control over those contractions. Um, so to try to improve this, we are uh, trying to make um, this engineered tissues, these ordinaries that I was telling you about, these EMTs from IPS cells. And for this, <clears throat> for this we are uh, again collaborating with the University of Washington, but also with a startup named uh, Turi Bio, who commercializes this uh, 24 wall plate with uh, two posts. It's very similar to uh, what was initially created for hydromyocytes by the lab of Thomas S. Uniden in Hamburg. Uh, so basically, I don't know if there is, yeah, I have one very small picture here, but basically the cells are embedded in a gel that is stretched between these two post system. One of them is flexible, one of them is stiff. So you can have what you see here, EMTs, and um, those EMTs have the ability to stretch, so to uh, leads to uh, post uh, displacement in space that is possible to, well, the device is able to record this and to, set, to let you know how much force was generated by the EMT, uh, depending on how much displacement the post has endured. So, through this collaboration, I was able to acquire this place and uh, make my own 
muscle jabs in this way. So now we have both labs have uh, the same system, and we are now collaborating in uh, trying to make them more mature um, by, uh, for example, implementing um, chemical stimuli or biophysical stimuli that will tell you about some few minutes. Um, <clears throat> we're able to stain them uh, entirely, uh, even either in uh, cross sections or longitudinal sections. But also, uh, we're making our best to have uh, a 3D reconstruction after tissue peeling and uh, light sheet microscopy. It's not perfectly working right now, but um, the tissue peeling process is a bit hard to, to set up. Uh, and like I said, um, the, the pending questions we have on this project is uh, can we improve the, NH, the EMT maturation level with physical clinical cues? So we'll try to add microRNA, we'll try to add, to add cytokines, but we'll also try to uh, pace the cells like you do with stage myocytes. Um, because we think that mimicking what happens during development as the motor neurons come by and innervate the muscle, um, will make them more mature some way. Um, another question, well, once we have achieved this improved maturation level, one of the questions we'd really like to answer is uh, what will be the DMD phenotype in these more mature EMTs? And after a while, can we use these EMTs to screen new therapeutic strategies, uh, obviously uh, gene therapy, but also pharmacological treatments? And finally, for the, the last aim uh, of our team, uh, I, I wanted to show you this uh, very first picture of an AAG8 CMG GFP uh, transducing uh, myotubes derived from iPS cells. Uh, as you can see here, um, those cells here express myosin, so they are muscle cells derived from EMTs. But they are also GFP positive, <coughs> which means that they have been transduced by AED, um, which somehow demonstrates that AED is able to transduce the cells, express a transgene, and that we will be able to use the plat to use the system and the cells as a platform to do in vitro gene therapy. So obviously, the next steps will be to determine. Uh, what would be the best AAG serotype to transduce myotubes and EMTs in 3D? Uh, how can we achieve the, uh, the best transduction level uh, in this somewhat artificial system? Can we correct the DMD phenotype with AAG vectors that express um, therapeutic transgenes? Um, and as you might know, in the lab, we have um, we have a strong track record uh, on uh, doing large animal gene therapy in GMG dogs with AED vectors that express either a transgene that will do epsom steeping and re-establish GMD expression, or bring a totally new microdystrophin transgene that will replace what the dystrophin was originally doing. And finally, lastly, can we use this EMC platform for high throughput analysis, high throughput screening of new AAD capsules, for example, or adjuvant molecules. And this goes back to uh, what I was initially trying to do during my PhD. Uh, hopefully at the time, well, hopefully in the few years, we'll be able to use EMTs to choose the best drug to associate with AAD and potentiate its efficiency in the muscles. muscles. Um, we are a very small group. So far, we started the activity in 2021, so we don't even have two years of activity. Um, this is, uh, yeah, so we have three people. Uh, Clemence is a PhD student who started this, her PhD a, a few months ago, and she is dealing with all this LAV and in vitro gene therapy study. And Elise is more focused on the uh, trying to understand what happens in the GMZ cells and the CRISPR. As the, as the IPS cells um, progresses through industrial myogenesis. We are always interested in new talents. So uh, if you know anyone 
be interesting to to uh, to join us and to uh, to participate in our in our in our studies. Just let me know. Uh, we don't really have funding right now, but we can help. It's a funding, obviously. Um, we are collaborating with Seattle, the University of Washington, and uh, particularly David Match. And we're also collaborating with a startup uh, in Lyon, in France, uh, which is um, interested in understanding um, what happens in the transcriptome as the cells go by through differentiation. And they, for this, they help us build uh, what they call gene regulatory networks. So those are very complex bioinformatics analysis that even I don't really understand. But these guys know what they do. And basically, they put all the data in the computer. And the computer tells you how the gene interacts with one another in time. And they will help us understand uh, what happens during development and what genes we should target if we want to improve the phenotype of the cells. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, all the sponsors and particularly the intern for funding me, um, the facilities that I'm working with in Nantes, and our, all our collaborators, and finally you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer, or we can just discuss about anything. Thank you.